the resurrection. Oh my. Hereafter or here and now. We could spend the rest of our lives arguing whether the hereafter is real. And I know you're all dying to find out. Because the reality is, the only way we can find out is to die. At least based on what we know now. This morning, I'm going to focus on the here and now. But not without something about the hereafter. Speaking personally, although I can't describe, explain, prove, or disprove it, I trust that there's something after death. I don't know what it is. I trust that it's there. And I leave that in God's hands. Actually, it's no more difficult for me to wrap my head around that than around the mind-blowing things I keep learning from science and cosmology. Here's an example. Before Stephen Hawking, scientists believed that nothing could survive falling into a black hole, that once it went in, nothing ever came out. It was the end of everything. But Hawking showed that black holes could actually emit thermal radiation. Something could come out of a black hole. And they've named that Hawking radiation, they've named that radiation, Hawking radiation, in his honor. And based on his new calculations, black holes are not the end of everything. They're both an ending and a beginning a kind of stellar life after death. Scientists have to be prepared to jump everything they believe about something in the light of new information that doesn't fit with what they used to believe. It's actually unscientific to claim that life after death is impossible. If you want to really start an interesting conversation, if somebody says to you, life after death is impossible, tell them they're being unscientific. It's unscientific because a true scientist would say, based on what we know now, life after death is improbable. But with new instruments, with new information, with a new Stephen Hawking, who knows? But let's not waste the rest of this life and the rest of this hour arguing about whether there's a next life. Instead, let's explore what resurrection might mean here and now. Let's examine what happens to Mary Magdalene at the tomb. Mary gets called by name. Now, who would you rather be called by name? Especially more so than be called there, as in, hello there. Ministers very quickly learn that lesson at the door at the church. You happen to forget someone's name, and you try to get away with it by saying, hello there, it doesn't work. Sometimes I forgot, if I forgot the person's name, I managed to redeem myself by strangely remembering the name of their dog or their cat. And that got me off the hook. When someone calls us by name, it feels good. They're acknowledging who we are. They're addressing us as a unique human being. Well, unique that is, as long as you don't have someone else's name. I happen to have my father's name. And he happened to have his father's name. That makes me Norman the Third. And as if that weren't bad enough, I made the mistake of telling my francophone friends at cadet camp of all places, I told them this, and then I became Norman the Turd. <laughs> I'm trusting I won't regret telling you that. Being called by our own name can spark a more engaging conversation, a deeper relationship 
And this is what we've been trying to do with our called by name, name tags project as we try to get to know each other better in our two congregations, Chalmers and Sydney Street. It's really important for coming up with a more engaging conversation, both interpersonally and interchurch. Mary doesn't know Jesus till he calls her by name from outside the tomb. Suddenly her grief, her despair, her loss of all hope is transformed. She has her own new beginning out of this dark ending. Her faith in Jesus' way of self-sharing love is given new life, is resurrected. Mary has her own resurrection in that garden, then and there. And there's the key to what resurrection can mean for us here and now. When our faith touches us personally, in whatever situation we're in at this moment, we experience a deepening, a more engaging conversation with our faith. It means more to us because it touches us where we live here and now. And this very often happens not in our celebratory times, but in our dark times, sometimes darkest times. Mary was at the tomb of one she loved, one whose way of life she was passionate about following, at least up until then. Not only had he been crucified, but now his body was missing. Insult added to injury. Mary was in her own dark tomb of despair. But these are often the very moments our resurrection finds us, calling us by name. I know this from my own experience. My faith had been more of a head trip for quite a while, until I had to wrestle with my own dark tomb, that is, my own closet of despair, wrestling with how to reconcile both my sexual and my spiritual orientations. What understanding of Jesus' way of self-sharing love could embrace both? That was my question. That was my struggle. And only in that struggle did I hear myself called by name. And I heard this through scriptures like three of these that I'm going to share with you. And who knows, maybe you will hear that humming too. Maybe you will hear yourself called by name this morning. The first was Jesus, when he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they started writing off, some say you're one of the prophets, some others say you're Elijah, others say you're John the Baptist. But he stopped them because they were writing off other people's opinions, and he stopped them and he said, but what about you? Who do you say I am? And the passage where God tells Moses, the place where you stand is holy ground. And if someone asks you my name, tell them it is I am who I am. Tell them I am sent you. And the story of Jacob wrestling with an angel or with God, we can't tell for sure, ending up with a limp, yes, but also blessed with a new name. Imagine how Anormi the third heard that. It's through our limps, our Good Fridays, that we come to our Easter Sundays. And if we pray away our Good Friday, as I try to pray away my orientation for all my adolescence and my early twenties, we may pray away our Easter too. We may pray away 
the very situation that would call us by name to our own resurrection. By the way, I'm not setting myself up as a model here, heaven forbid, and heaven already forbids it, so I'm not trying to do that. I'm just sharing out of personal experience what it's like to be called by name, that it can happen, of having my trust in Jesus' way of self-sharing love resurrected. I'm trying to practice what I'm preaching while I'm preaching it, by sharing this personal experience of my faith. And personal experience of our faith is what we're talking about here. Being called by name. Dr. Robin Myers, in his book, Spiritual Defiance, writes this. Without passion, there is no persuasion. And there is no passion without personal involvement. What I can call personal experience. Personal experience, being called by name, fuels our passion for Jesus' way of self-sharing love. And it's that passion that's most persuasive, not arguments to prove the existence of an afterlife or even of God or of any of the thousand other dogmatic shocks the church is heir to. This passion arising from personal experience, being called by name, that's what will cause others to pay attention. And it's through this passion that they'll be able to hear themselves called by me. We so-called liberal progressive Christians have been uncomfortable with the over-the-top personal testimonies of our more conservative cousins. So we've tended to avoid saying anything personal about our faith. Maybe, though, it's time to consider adopting something of their approach. They're recognizing that some kind of personal relationship with Jesus, one where we hear him calling us by name, is indispensable. It's indispensable for putting his self-sharing love into action with passion, with conviction, with the energy we need to keep our social justice from burning out. This personal connection can resurrect our faith in Jesus' way of self-sharing love. It can give our life a new beginning, a life after death, a resurrection. Here and now. And this is true for us, not just personally, but also collectively, as the church, the Christian church, the whole Christian church throughout the world. I think the church, much more than a refit, needs a rebirth, a resurrection. We, the church, need to listen again outside the tomb of our used to be for our faith calling us by name. Robin Myers, again, how can you tell I'm a fan, borrowing from another author, suggests in really thought-provoking ways the church could be resurrected. And he lists a whole bunch of them, and I'd like to share just four with you. Under the shocking heading, if the church were Christian, talk about conversation starters or stoppers, here's the first two. Inviting questions would be valued more than supplying answers. Encouraging personal exploration would be more important than communal uniformity. These first two are what we'll be doing in our upcoming Combined with Chalmers discussion group called Reconsidering What It Means to the Church. We're going to be starting this two weeks from today after church, and Reverend Wayne Hilliker and Lynn Freeman and I will be facilitating the discussion. 
and all are welcome to come. If you have any suggestions for how we might reconsider the church, there is your opportunity. Also, even greater, Robin Myers will be the guest speaker at Chalmers Philippa Preaching Lectureship September the 28th and 29th, and, sorry, 29th and 30th. Both of these have more detail about them in the bulletin, but I wanted to mention them here because they tie in so well with what we're talking about. The next two in his list, if the church were Christian, gracious behavior would be more important than right belief. And the fourth one, this life would be more important than the afterlife. The here and now, more value than the hereafter. And that brings us back to where we started. When Jesus called Mary Magdalene by name, her faith in Jesus' way of self-sharing love was resurrected. She was given a new beginning, here and now, a life with new meaning and new hope. If we, both individually and as a church, keep our spiritual ears open, we'll be able to experience our own resurrection. We'll hear the eternal humming in our everyday space-time. Outside the black hole of our used-to-be, we'll hear our faith calling us by name, embracing us here and now. In a ruby throat coming, a book that speaks our truth, our cat's grateful rumble, and estranged friends, I'm sorry. Our partner's first, I love you. Our newborn's first cry. Our parents' last words. We will live every single day with hope, but not just any hope, with hope of resurrection, both here and now, and hereafter. So, happy Easter. Amen.